Hi, I am Rajkala. Today we are going to see on a very important topic on first aid. The initial assistance or treatment given to a casualty for any injury or sudden illness before the arrival of an ambulance, doctor or other qualified person is called first aid. The notion of first itself signifies that the casualty is likely to be need of secondary aid. After completion of the module, you will be able to identify the emergency situation, understand the roles and responsibilities of the first aider and be enabled to act as a first aider in any place. Illness, accidents and other emergencies to guests and staffs unfortunately occur from time to time in any establishment. Under the Health and Safety Regulation Act 1982, the employer must provide first aid equipment, facilities and personnel and must inform his or her employees of the first aid arrangements made. First aid personnel should be available at all times and the staffs should know who they are. What is the purpose of first aid treatment? It is to keep the injured or ill person alive, to prevent the injured condition from becoming worse, to help him or her to recover and to sustain life. Now let us see what the first aid box should contain. First aid boxes are required to be kept and made available to all members of the staffs in certain areas of the establishment. The boxes must be checked regularly to ensure that they do not contain less than the minimum required by law. A minimum variety of certain types of supplies should be ensured at all times. A 17 and half inch into 10 inch into 6 and half inch dirt proof box is ideal. A more comprehensive stock of material is usually kept in the housekeeping department. The first aid box must contain at least the following items. An antiseptic cream which can be useful for cuts and grazes antiseptic solution for cleaning the affected area, antihistamine lotion can be rubbed on bites, stings and sunburns, calamine lotion which is a medicated liquid containing zinc carbonated and has a soothing effect on painful sunburns. It can also relieve itching caused by minor insect bites and stings in the absence of an allergy. Antacid tablets. It gives relief from mild indigestion and heartburns. Anti-diarrheal tablets, these are used to relieve diarrhea by slowing down the bowel movements. Paracetamol, which is used for relieving the pain and lowering a higher temperature. Methyl salicylate ointment, to rub onto a strained or bruised muscle. It will also ease the spams and pain. Chloromycetin eye ointment. This can be used in case of bacterial infection of the eye such as bacterial conjunctivitis. Sophromycin skin ointment, this can be used in case of bacterial infections of the skin and in burns too. Travel sickness tablets, these can be taken before a journey or as directed on the label. Oil of cloves for an aching tooth for a temporary relief. Clinical thermometers, it can be used either orally or under the arm for checking the temperature. Sterilized white absorbent gauze. This dressing can be used dry with no cream or ointment to dress a minor wound. Sterilized dressings for use on fingers, hands, legs and other body parts. Sterilized cotton wool. These can be used to pad a dressing or to clean an injury. Adhesive plasters. These can be used on minor wounds or to secure a dressing. Roller bandages can be used for securing the dressings, to apply pressure to control the bleeding and to give support to sprains and strains. Unbleached triangular bandages, a type of bandage that makes a sling to support an injured wrist or elbow. Eye pads for placing on the eye in case of an eye injury. Tweezers to remove the splinters from the skin, dressing scissors to use when cutting away dressings or bandages, safety pins to 
to be used for fixing the bandages or slings in place, a small pad and pencil for writing. Now let us know the role of a first aider. There are three steps to be taken in consideration before starting the actual first aid. Number one is the scene survey. When confronted with an accident or illness on duty, it is important to assess the situation to determine what kind of emergency situation you are dealing with for your safety, the victim's safety and that of others. Do a quick survey of the scene that includes looking into three elements, hazards that could be dangerous to you, the victim or bystanders, the cause of the injury or illness and the number of victims. Make sure the assessment does not take more than a few seconds. Second is initial assessment. The goal of initial assessment is to visually determine whether there are life threatening or other serious problems that require quick care. For example, bleeding, choking, fractures, etc. Determine if the victim is conscious by tapping and shouting near them and check for A, B and C. A stands for check if the airway is open or else tilt the head and lift the chin. B is for breathing. Look listen and feel if they are breathing and C for circulation, check for the signs of circulation. These step by step initial assessment should not be changed. It takes just less than a minute to complete. Third is the victim assessment sequence. If victim is responsive, ask them what injuries or difficulties they are experiencing Check and provide first aid for these complaints as well as others that may be involved. If the victim is non-responsive, unconscious or incoherent, observe for obvious signs of injury or illness. Check from the head to toe. Provide first aid or CPR for injuries or illness observed. CPR is cardiopulmonary resuscitation. We shall learn about it a little later. Now, let us see on the first aid to be provided for some of the situations of accidents and illnesses. Asphyxia or suffocation. This may be due to exposure to poisonous gas or due to something choking the victim. Try to find the cause of suffocation and remove it. Turn off any escaping gas, open the windows or take the victim into the open. In the case of choking, remove the obstruction from the victim's nose or mouth. In all cases, give artificial respiration if breathing has stopped using a mouth to mouth or kiss of life method. We will see about artificial respiration a little later. Next is asthma. During an attack of asthma, the person has difficulty in breathing and the there is a feeling of suffocation. A person who has chronic asthma would have been prescribed the use of an inhaler and other medications during an attack. These medications should be administered to the patient and he or she should be reassured until better. Next is burns and scars. Burns may be caused by dry heat or by hot fat or oil. For minor burns on the limbs, immediately hold the injury under the cold running water for 5 minutes. A small burn needs no further treatment. It should be simply left exposed to air. Do not apply any oil or ointment to the burn and do not prick or remove the blisters. Large and deep burns covering more than 3 square inches need medical attention. If possible, Relieve the pain by immersing the area in cold water or applying cold wet cloths. Wrap and cover the injury with a clean cloth and a light bandage. Treat the victim for shock while waiting for medical help. If the victim can be moved, it is best to take him to the hospital. In case of chemical burns on a large area of the body, especially that caused by a strong acid or alkali, 
put the victim under cold running water and showers if possible. In case of fire burns, if the victim's clothing is on fire, smother the flames in a rug or blanket. Afterwards, lay the person flat. Remove any smoldering clothing if it is adhering to the skin. Otherwise, dampen the smoldering garments with cold water but do not press the wet cloth against the patient's skin. If possible, remove any jewellery, watch, socks or shoes near the burnt area before the tissues have time to swell. Cover the burns with a clean cloth which can be held in position with a light bandage. While waiting for medical help, treat for shock by keeping the patient quiet and covering him or her lightly with a blanket. Scalds are caused by moist heat from hot liquid or steam. In case of scalds, remove any hot clothing from the skin immediately and pour plenty of cold water over the burnt area. Next is choking. The usual response of the victim while choking is violent cough because food or some foreign body is caught in the windpipe. If the coughing does not clear the blockage, get the victim to bend over and give him or her a hard slap between the shoulder blades. If this does not lodge the object, put the victim face down on a table or chair with the head and chest hanging downwards and administer another hard slap in the same place. Another method is to make the victim stand facing the back of a chair and push the backrest against the casualty stomach with force. Repeat a few times. In the case of a small child, hold him upside down and slap on the back. If this is not successful, get medical aid immediately. Concussion. This is caused by a blow on the head. Concussion may render the casualty unconscious. If on discussing the incident later, loss of memory of the accident is evident, then concussion should be suspected. The person should be treated for shock and taken to the hospital. Convulsions or fits. Convulsions may occur in babies and children during teething or a very high fever. The child typically holds his or her breath, becomes rigid and often goes purple in the face. He or she should be kept warm by covering with a blanket or being placed into a warm bath with someone in attendance. Meanwhile, a doctor should be called. A person, child or adult who falls to the ground with violent movements of the arms and legs may be having an ep epileptic fit. An epileptic fit can also take the shape of a person suddenly becoming spaced out. Move the furniture and other obstacles out of the way to reduce the risk of injury if the convulsions is violent one. Try to slip a knotted handkerchief between the person's teeth and never a hard spoon or similar thing. After the seizure stops, simply sit with the person until he or she returns to normalcy. Do not attempt to shake them, awake or similar things. On regaining the consciousness, the epileptic may be dazed and should be prevented from wandering off in this state. Cuts and aberrations. These may be caused in many ways and may sometimes get infected if not treated properly. The wound should be cleaned with warm water and antiseptic solution and then covered with a clean dressing. In case of bleeding, pressure should not be applied on the wound if it is free of foreign particles such as glass or metal. For deep cuts and excessive bleeding, the person should be treated for shock and if necessary taken to a hospital. Dislocation. When a joint is dislocated, the casualty is unable to move it in a usual way. There may be a swelling and numbness beyond the point where the dis dislocation has occurred. Do not attempt to replace the bone in proper place. Keep the parts as still as possible till the doctor arrives. Diabetes. This is a disorder in which a person's body is not able to regulate the uptake of available sugar as a result of which excess sugar may appear in the blood and urine. Many diabetics whose sugar levels are difficult to control 
depend on insulin and a controlled diet. When such a person eats insufficient food, there is an imbalance due to insulin administered and the person may become hypoglycemic, that is lowered sugar level in the body. In hypoglycemia, the patient starts to perspire and becomes nervous or irritable. If hy hypoglycemia is not controlled, the person may go into a diabetic shock resulting in a coma. At the first sign of hypoglycemia, the diabetic should be given two lumps of sugar or a piece of chocolate or a glucose drink. If the patient does not respond, he or she should be taken to the hospital immediately. Electric shock. If the victim is still in contact with the electrical equipment, he or she should not be touched until the electric current has been switched off. It may be necessary to try to drag the appliance away from the victim by pulling the insulating wire leading to it. If this is not possible, separate the victim from the electrical source using a non-conducting object such as dry wooden stick. If the casualty's heart does not seem to be beating, give the breastbone in the center of the chest a sharp thump. If the victim is not breathing, start mouth to mouth artificial respiration at once and continue until the medical aid arrives. If the victim is breathing but unconscious, place him or her in the recovery position and treat for burns and shocks. Eye injuries. If rapid blinking fails to dislodge a speck of dust fallen into the eye, lift the lid of the affected eye by the lashes and try to remove the object with the corner of a clean handkerchief. However, do not attempt to remove anything from the cornea which is transparent, domed front of the eyeball. If the object is embedded in the eyeball or cannot be seen, cover the eye with a gauze pad held tightly in place with a plaster and arrange immediate transport to the hospital. If any acid or other corrosive agents have come into contact with the eye, they should be washed out immediately. Both the eyes with cold water if possible, keeping it under the running water for 10 to 15 minutes to ensure that all acid is washed out. Take the casualty to the hospital immediately. Fainting. Fainting may be caused by a sudden reduction in the blood flow or oxygen to the head. It may be the result of a slowing down of the heartbeat from shock, anxiety or even hormonal changes in early pregnancy. If someone feels faint, get the person to lie down with the feet raised above the level of the head. Avoid crowding. In doing so, as to get plenty of air and then be treated for shock. Heart attack. It is due to clotting of blood in the heart and manifests itself by acute chest pain, breathlessness and feeling faint. The patient should be propped up and made to sit on a chair and on no account move till the ambulance or doctor arrives. Poisoning. Poisoning may result from swallowing, inhaling or injecting poisonous substances. In most cases, when poisoning has taken by mouth, the patient should be made to warm it by swallowing warm water with salt or mustard in it and prevented from sleeping till the doctor or ambulance arrives. If the position is known to be corrosive, then vomiting should be avoided and patient should be taken to the hospital as soon as possible. Now coming to the artificial respiration. The most important technique to know for first aid include administering CPR and the Holger Nielsen method of artificial respiration. First, let us see on CPR, that is cardiopulmonary resuscitation. This procedure is carried out upon a person whose respiration has ceased. A constant supply of oxygen is vital for the brain, and if breathing stops, blood oxygen levels will be affected as all tissues get oxygen through the blood circulation. The heart acts as a pump and maintain circulation in the body. If the heart also stops, then it will lead to death unless proper action is taken at the correct time. The flow of oxygenated blood to the brain is in such case rapidly restored by means of artificial ventilation and chest compression. This dual technique is called 
cardio pulmonary resuscitation or CPR. In case only breathing has stopped, the techniques for chest compression to stimulate or stimulate cardiac function can be left out and only artificial respiration is to be concentrated on. Now let us see on the A, B, C of artificial respiration. A for airway that is to clear the airway, B for breathing to restore the breathing and C for circulation that is to restore the circulation. Clearing the airway, an unconscious casualties airway may be blocked making breathing difficult and noisy. The main reason for this is that muscular control in the throat is lost which allows the tongue to sack back and block the throat. What we have to do for this? Remove the obstructing object or substance from the mouth with our fingers using our first finger as the hook to dislodge it. Extend the neck to open the airway. Place one hand under the nape of the neck and place the other hand on the forehead and tilt the head back. Lift the chin up gently without closing the mouth. Check if breathing has been restored, if not, start mouth to mouth resuscitation. Next is restoring breathing. This is done by administering mouth to mouth respiration. Put your face close to the casualty's mouth and look, listen and feel for the breathing for 5 seconds before taking any further action. If the heart is beating, it will generate a pulse in the neck that is the carotid pulse where the main arteries pass up to the head. Slide your fingers along the victim's throat till it sits in the gap between the Adam's apple and the strap muzzle and feel for the carotid pulse. Restore breathing by giving mouth to mouth resuscitation. To start mouth to mouth artificial respiration, pinch and compress the nose to close the nostrils. Take a deep breath, place your mouth around the victim's mouth making an airtight seal and quickly breathe into the victim's mouth four times. Refill your lungs by inhaling deeply after this. Fill the victim's chest with air once, and once every five seconds. Watch the victim's chest movement for rise and fall of chest. Allow the patient to exhale. If the chest does not rise, check that the head is tilted sufficiently far back you have a firm seal around the casualty's mouth. You have closed the nostrils completely and make sure the airway is obstructed by vomit, blood or any foreign body. In case of mouth to nose ventilation where there is mouth injuries or harmful substance has been inject, ingested through the mouth, the following method should be followed. Close the casualty's mouth. Form a tight seal with your lips around the casualty's nose and blow in. Open the mouth to let the breathe out. Repeat the procedure. The third is restoring the circulation. This is achieved by external cardiac compression. The procedure is also known as external cardiac massage. This can be carried out by one individual or two people. Place the victim on a hot surface, kneel at the victim's side, locate the xiphoid process, measure to 1 to 2 inches above the xiphoid process, place the heel of one hand at this point on the sternum, place the other hand on top of it, interlock the fingers to keep them off the victim's rib. Now keep the elbow straight and lean forward making full sense of your body weight to deliver a downward compression upon the breastbone. Apply steady, smooth pressure to depress the victim's sternum by 1.5 to 2 inches. Release pressure completely, but do not let your hands leave the victim's chest or you may lose the correct hand position. Repeat again. If there are two individuals to perform first aid, the other person should continue with artificial respiration in the meantime. If there is only one person, perform cardiopulmonary resuscitation for one minute as follows. After 15 chest compressions, give two quick lung inflations 
by mouth to mouth breathing. And then two more inflations if the carotid pulse is still absent. Continue CPR by alternating the lung inflations with the chest depressions for a minute or until the victim is breathing on his or her own and the pulse is found. A minute of CPR delivers 60 chest compressions that is 15 at a time multiplied by 4 times and 8 long inflations that is 2 at a time multiplied by 4 times. To sum up, the main steps of cardiopulmonary resuscitation are as follows. Clear the airway, breathe into the victim's mouth 4 times quickly, compress chest for 15 times, give 2 quick lung inflations, alternate 15 chest compressions with 2 quick lung inflations. In a minute, the victim should revive. Next is Holger Nielsen method of artificial respiration. In this method of administering artificial respiration, the patient is turned face downwards with the head turned on one side, kneeling at the patient's head and placing both your hands over the shoulder blades. Pressure should be exerted here by slowly rocking forward. For an adult, the pressure weight may be about 13.6 kgs. The patient's arms are raised by the elbow to expand the chest and release the pressure by means of rocking backwards. The process is repeated until the doctor or an ambulance arrives. Each place of expansion and compression should last about two and a half seconds, the complete cycle being repeated 12 times per minute. Thus, without proper action at proper time, danger awaits us with a bigger face. We must act on time when a person is injured. We must take care of the person the way it is meant. Otherwise, a valuable life might be lost. We need to understand how precious lives of people are and what importance first aid carries in saving these precious lives. I hope by now you would have understood basic first aid treatment to be provided in case of an emergency. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Thank you.